be speaking about actor network theory today. So what I'm trying to do is, uh, I'm trying to connect it to cultural studies. In particular, the focus will be on digital uh, digitality, the idea of a digital presence within cultural studies and how we can use the actor network theory to actually make sense of this sort of understanding of contemporary culture. I'm sure most of you would be familiar with Bodrua, uh, familiar with the idea of the simulacrum and the simulacra, the concept of the prosumers. You know, you no longer are you talking about the divide between a producer and a consumer within media, but you're actually talking about people who are at the same time producers as well as consumers. This is a term which was uh, coined by Alan Toffler quite a while ago, but it has great relevance even today. And it is within this context that I will be talking about the actor network theory. And uh, I'll give you the idea first, and then I'll give you a couple of examples also. And you know, sometimes you may feel that uh, this is very new or rather, this has no relevance, but that is far from the truth because actor network theory uh, talks about the contemporary world. And when you do eco criticism or you do game a study of game culture, the idea, the tools given to you by actor network theory will be of great use to you uh, because, you know, I had a student who was doing a PhD in eco criticism and um, yeah, as our reading uh, sort of progressed over the past four or five years, uh, we stumbled upon Bruno Latour and Karen Barad and um, agential materialism and all that. And her thesis actually took a um, twist that, that there was a turn there actually in the synop, the way the chapters were presented and all that. So what happened was that we included we include these insight afforded to us by uh, agential materialism, which is part of the actor network theory. And the examiners actually uh, commented particularly on that, positively commented on that because they said that, you know, eco criticism has really taken a new turn with the advent of such thinking and such thoughts. So uh, please, do, if any of you are skeptical regarding the usefulness of this idea, uh, be reassured this is going to be of great use to you because it gives you a different slant in your writings in the conception of your hypothesis as well. So to begin with, let us look at the digital concept in cultural studies or digital cultural studies and digital culture. All right. And quickly, then we will go on to the concept of at at we know what culture is. It is the lived life experience of individuals uh, and you're sort of focusing on a particular space during a specific time span. Um, and uh, cultural differences between groups have been at the very core of cultural and social anthropology. So we uh, uh, actually internalize a cultural model at birth, consciously as well as unconsciously, and you make it your own by imitation and it is expressed in the regional language. It is a flexible thing. So culture, we realize changes date. It might not be tangible. The change might not be tangible on a day to day basis because we often talk about tradition and convention, all that. But if you really stop to think, we have actually frozen a particular period of time and according to convenience and said that that is our uh, tradition and that is our convention because uh, at different periods are different conventions. And that is why it is said that culture is actually a, or cultural uh, model is a flexible model and it is subject to continuous change. And the introduction of new technologies has led to changes which required readjustment or new articulations of relations between various fields of knowledge. I hope you have understood because uh, you can actually think of a huge cultural difference that has happened with the advent of mobile phones, for example, or uh, the internet or uh, video games. There has been a paradigm shift in our idea of culture. So technical revolutions, we could say, have turned to be cultural revolutions also. Now, this is where, you know, the, the entire idea of interdisciplinarity has to be spoken about because without looking at the medical discourse, without looking at the technological understanding, you cannot have a wholesome idea about any novel. Even though the novel may be written completely based on somebody's imagination, you have to contextualize the text. And that is why we go on talking about, you know, how has technology changed your perspective? For example, this week.
invention of the wheel changed their perspective of human beings. That is the beginning of technology, the steam engine, the passage uh, of, to a written culture from an oral culture and to a very, very visual culture now. And if you ask um, a person who has done teacher training for kindergarten students, they would tell you that um, these children are kinesthetic in their learning senses and sensibility because they need to do things in order to understand. So if the one generation was uh, auditory in nature, they listened and understood. Then you had a very visual sort of culture coming in. Now you have a kinesthetic culture coming in. Now, technology is not the machine itself, but the relationship. What I'm trying to talk about is the relationship between human beings, technology and multiple fields of knowledge. So new technologies are modifying everything. So technology is modifying our idea of time space relationships and types of communication and what the you know, the uh, irony of it is that multiple types of cultural models can coexist at the same time so it is not possible to say now this has come to an end and now this is this is beginning it is coexistence so this is a sort of coexistence in diverse cultural models using multiple fields of knowledge so different pace of development in different societies in the world has been uh, at a different paces. And this has uh, generally caused a lot of confusion as well. Now, the emergence of digital technologies can become both a threat as well as opportunities. Uh, dig digital technologies operate to construct virtual te territories and environments. They can contribute also to the commodification and exploitation of cultural heritage resources. So uh, now what I am trying to focus here is uh, the constant give and take between modes of production and the cultural tangent of a particular period or a particular time. And um, if I were to briefly talk about actor network theory, the idea of the actor, the idea of the actor, when we think of in a very grammatic, uh, quite a grammatic, only a grammatical sense, you have the actor who is doing the action and the object is being acted upon. So in a grammatical use of the term actor, you will find that an actor acts upon something and this something is an object upon which the uh, actor has acted upon. But um, Bruno Latour, Colin and a host of other actor network theorists have actually come up with a different model of understanding this. They actually talk about the idea of agency. And they say that, now look, if the actor is supposed to be in the subject position, the actor is acting upon something, uh, the object is also acting upon the actor. It is a sort of uh, interconnected relationship where you cannot remove the subject position completely from the object or you cannot actually give complete agency to the actor. And they have different ideas about the concept of the actor as well. I hope I have a particular notion clear. Now, uh, uh, we spoke about culture, the idea of a digital culture. Uh, and why we talk about a digital culture is it is very explicit to uh, explicit that the technology has created a huge impact on our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, for, a, for quite some time, you know, we were not thinking uh, so much about this because we took a lot of it for granted. But now we have seen a sudden transition uh, with the internet, with the pace of communication, with this communication, a, a communication aiding globalization. We realize that it is not easy to sort of split the idea of communication on one side and technology on the other side and culture on a different plane altogether. These are mutually interrelating fields. And to understand why a person uh, chooses something which is part of culture, why a person decides to do something, uh, unless and until we get the contemporary context properly, we will not be able to understand it. And that is exactly what the actor network theory is trying to tell us. So I'll just briefly give you a, a couple of definitions about the actor network theory. One second, let me just get that slide open. So the ANT, all right, uh, that is how it is referred to also. Yeah, so the ANT is an approach to research that engages with the 
body of materialism so uh, the idea that uh, there is a presence there is physicality and this is connected to it so please remember uh, connected to both post humanism as well as to nomadic theory because actor network theory is connected to nomadic theory as well nomadic theory like i said is quite uh, uh, inclusive and uh, it is a very very flexible idea it keeps changing if you uh, and actor network theory when you place it within the broader ambit of nomadic theory is like where we talk about post humanism and the idea of transhumanism which is a particular concept within post humanism in much the same way actor network theory is placed within the wider ambit of nomadic theory and actor network theory or agential materialism deals with the idea of a material culture and this is actually questioning the concept of humanism and when i talk about humanism i'm not just talking about the modern idea of humanism which was very exclusive in nature that was one part of the resistance the second is the idea that the humans are um, actors right and everybody everything else all the other animals the, the nature around us they are all uh, what do i say objects or something that the human beings are acting upon so like eco criticism or deep eco ecology actor network theory also displaces the idea of a core human presence that is uh, very powerful and instead it considers a dynamic assemblage of human and non human i hope that yeah so you have these are the writers who are associated with actor network theory Callan Lato and John Law these are called the three uh, people who sort of began this concept okay who initiated this and you have Borgic you have Hadadian and Mogadam who wrote in 2012 and you have BOLL Ball in 2016 so uh, and talks about uh, the enactment of heterogeneous assemblances assemblages like i said you can actually again look at the idea of rhizome you can look at the idea of quilting and the role of the researcher so they actually um, and you know somebody asked me uh, one day i think it was in a personal conversation one of you here told me you know uh, the when sir, you use the word i or you use the word you in a, a very academic context doesn't that become a problem so it doesn't become a problem actually with actor network theory and post humanism because they feel that they give a lot of importance to the person who is looking at the context see uh, initially why the reason why we did not use i or you in an academic discourse was that the i or you was supposed to be neutral and the objective objective uh, the ob, uh, what do i say the complete objectivity of the researcher was taken for granted but within actor network theory the idea is that complete objectivity is not possible so you are very much imbricated within the research therefore actor network theory looks at the researcher the person who is conducting the research because the knowledge that is produced by the researcher cannot be seen as an objective type of knowledge because the researcher is definitely placed within the ambit of the research i hope you understand so um, if the researcher has an impact on the research that she is doing the object or the event that is being researched also plays upon the researcher so it is this type of assemblage that the actor network theory is problematizing and again let me tell you uh, when you encounter academics who are stuck with deconstruction they may not look upon this very favorably but if you are looking to explore new avenues if you're looking for funding you're looking for scholarships within and outside the country and you're looking for newer ideas definitely all these tools of analysis have to be taken into consideration and the paradigm shift that has occurred within literature research also has to be taken about uh, i'm not addressing this to any of those academics who believe that with derrida research has reached the pinnacle and there is 
nothing uh, you know forward or with cultural studies that that's it no that is not the case at all these are newer and newer ideas that are emerging and you have people talking about auto modernity as well and auto modernity cannot be spoken about without reference to technology and the impact that technology has upon the human this is exactly what the actor network theory is trying to problematize so yeah ANT puts forward a number of propositions. First, the world is made up of actors as well as actants, right? Actants, things upon which the actors act. But the binary doesn't exist because if the actor is acting, then the actant is also acting upon the actor. And within the dynamics of A ant, human beings are not privileged. Uh, and that is something which is reiterated in nomadic theory. It is um, uh, underscored in posthumanism as well. Now, the principle of irreduction. Reduction uh, prefix, prefix with IR. So there is no possibility of reduction. That is, you are not looking at the core or the essence into an assemblage. When, when I talk about an assemblage, it means multiple factors coming together so this is an assemblage you cannot reduce it to one or two or three factors these three factors coming together become something different so you cannot reduce it to one all right actors are nothing other than their action at the particular point of time um, again uh, with deep ecology with the digital culture this has huge resonance and thirdly the concept of translation when i talk about translation it is conversion from one media into something else and the process of mediation that transform objects when they encounter each other and the principle of alliance so alliances are these meeting points and these actants the objects which are being acted upon gain strength through these alliances all right so ant insists that researchers now again the self-reflexivity comes in you should refute any pre-given distinction between classes of possible actors so there is no you have to reject certain divides which they have called artificial and what are these divides local slash global because if you look at it from a very Derridian point of view, the local is there within the global and so is the opposite. Because, you know, after travel began, there is no way that you can separate the local and the global, nature, social and so on. And they are focusing on network building and network consolidation. So if you were to read Lato or you were to read any one of those writers that I have mentioned, you will find that they use a lot of terminology from technology, particular from computers. So the idea of assemblages, the idea of alliances, all these things are that vocabulary is a very technologically oriented or technologically based vocabulary. So again, humans as well as non-humans are treated as possible actors and each gives meaning to any situation. The basis of every action and decision depends on the actor's subjective interpretations and these are made mutually adjusted in interaction with others we're talking about a very very dependent sort of relationship where you do not have one core factor and multiple others so that is a feudal model where you have one person in power and multiple others who are dependent on this person for power this was a feudal concept of society but if you really look at it the feudal overlord was actually dependent on the masses for his existence. So this is the dichotomy that has been broken apart. And we understand that any connection or any power structure cannot be top down. It has to be, cap like this is a Foucauldian term actually, it has to be capillary in nature. And this sort of assemblage is irreducible. And at a, after a certain point of time, we do not have a clear understanding as to who the actor is and what the actant is. Because if you have tried to give a grammatical label and say the actor is has agency and has the ability to make a change in the actant, on further and detailed analysis, we find that the actant also has an equally important role to play in the process of reinventing the actor. So we have to 
develop a sensitivity to engage with the world as an open repository. So look at the term again, the vocabulary is borrowed from the digital world. So open repository of terms, texts, concepts, and testing modes of attuning to the social life of things and to what an actor might be and how things and authors coexist, clash, differ, and associate. So there is a repository of paradigms that have shaped the intellectual practices of the whole community of scholars. So at this point of time, I shall give you an example. An example, um, none, nothing other than the Indian freedom struggle. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, there is this idea that India clothed the world, particularly during the uh, period of imperialism. This was the idea. Okay. So what these researchers are doing is they're tracking the modern history of cloth and fashion in the subcontinent and connecting it to the freedom struggle and the idea of imperialism also. So the concept is this, you know, uh, there was this vibrant textile trade in the 17th century that attracted East India Company and it brought low cost, high quality Indian textiles for the consumer fashion market later. This happens later. So what has happened is that if you remember Mahatma Gandhi and the initial struggles that Gandhi engaged in, it was about indigo cultivation and uh, the forced cultivation of indigo in India. So the question that uh, actor network theory would raise is that, look, did we have agency, did the human have agency that we were acting upon the indigo plant or was it the indigo plant that actually was acting upon this entire network of human beings, whether they were um, imperial traders or they were the first colonial farmers in India. So by the 19th century, we know that uh, English manufacturers had succeeded in mechanizing textile production. In the second half of the century, they were exporting their cheaper industrially produced fabrics to India. And they were decimating the Indian handicraft industry in the period, increasing colonial trade governance and Western education and promoting European dress. And this gained popularity among the elite. So what we're doing here is that we're looking at that particular element. It can be the indigo plant, it can be the fabric, and how these things are acting upon a particular continent, the culture of a particular nation. And by the end of the 19th century, Western cloth and clothing had come to represent the exploitative nature of colonialism. I hope you understand this. So initially, if Western, Western clothing and Western um, uh, style of dressing was seen as elitist by the next century, 19th century onwards, it was seen as very, very exploitative because the people had been educated. They were being sensitized towards how the textile industry has functioned as a spoke in the wheel of imperialism and how colonialism is uh, the enterprise of imperialism is furthered in the colonies using this industry. So uh, what actor network theory does is to not just look at the human beings and the entire idea of the industrialization and the fabric in, a, in the background, rather it brings it to the foreground and see, looks at how the plants have actually acted upon the actions of the human beings themselves. And the question, now who has more agency? And uh, now look at this, uh, the na nationalist movement, particularly Mahatma Gandhi, took the form of, and the icon was the traditionally hand-spun Indian cotton, Khadi, of course. So you're, you, you're moving into another context altogether. And the entire idea of nationalism is being projected into this icon of the spinning wheel and Khadi. So Gandhiji has had said that Swadeshi is the soul of Swaraj and Khadi is the essence of Swadeshi. So the, he was trying to uh, put an abstract notion into a concrete idea. So instead of uh, talking about, uh, you know, Swadeshi and Swaraj and all that, 
he just gave this symbol a very very tangible symbol of cotton cloth which you could weave at home without the interference of western industrialization and said that this is the essence of swadeshi and when you read the uh, biographies of mahatma gandhi you will realize that you know that there was a particular reason as to why he uh, resisted industrialization because he knew at that the point of time uh, that industrialization was killing the indian uh, artisan but later this became a fault because the yeah, uh, indian people needed industrialization and gandhi ji being an organic thinker his opinions okay so locally produced handmade bone modest traditional indian styles khadi dress often all white became a national symbol or became the fabric you could say of indian independence and after independence you look at the symbol now khadi comes to stand in for austerity and uh, the aesthetic sensibility of the indian elite and nehru's brand of nationalism and the nehruvian brand of nationalism was developmentalist constrained consumption and import substitute production so these were the ideas and all these ideas were sort of focused on to the uh, the uh, fabric of khadi now uh, in the 1980 then after that you know what happens is that khadi becomes very very expensive and the khadi becomes something that the ordinary people cannot wear only the elite can wear and in the 1980s and 90s there was huge shift in the indian economy uh, and the, it was uh, suddenly you were embracing all of us in india were embracing liberalism and finally global consumerism so khadi cloth and clothing have been on the decline and subject to reinvigoration by brand marketing logistics so uh, if you look at it khadi has become a brand now and not an easily accessible brand also so the idea of khadi which began as austere and aesthetic has now shifted so khadi has acted upon the human uh, 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 other colonies and so has the human acted upon this concept of khadi in 2001 khadi was branded uh, and ironically if not surprisingly it was positioned as a high end elite fashionable fabric so the visible presence of a global brand on mass produced ready made garments showed that you had left behind moral consumerism and you had embraced globalization now just from by looking at the textile industry you can find this so with liberalization you have a very different vision of the relationship of a commodity to the nation and this was mediated by the closer distance of the global brand by fashionable brand consumption rather than commodity production so you're moving uh, again connected to the marxian commodity fetish so the ideological imaginary turned on the increased visibility of branded commodities and uh, again when you look at uh, indian markets you have glitzy malls on one side and you have these uh, branded goods there on the pavement right outside these malls you have export defects duplicates counterfeits and they spill out on local shops and bazaars and roadside platform and here a majority of indians who are excluded from the mall culture by their financial status can actually feel the pride given by a brand because they can have access to these export reject brands and young men wear this for fashion and for style so if we follow the brand logic they are inauthentic they are unauthorized they are fake if the brand represents the official face of liberalization the surfeit is the unofficial face the shadow economy illegal illegitimate you know carnivalesque so yeah this is the the example that i was trying to give you that is you are trying to look at the indian freedom struggle the idea of the indian consumer culture based on the uh, idea of a fabric idea of a particular piece of cloth or a textile and how that industry actually acts upon is not as uh, strong as we think it is rather it is very fragile it is very fleeting and it is a mutually give and take sort of relationship therefore the actor actor relationship the non human human relationship is very fragile 
and uh, in no under no circumstance can the human being claim to be at the core or the essence or the lawgiver or the rule maker there because the human is also acted upon i hope this example has made that clear yeah so to come back to ants yeah understanding uh, ant uh, sort of uh, examines five things the nature of groups so when we talk about these assemblages what are the type of assemblages that are produced the nature of the action in each course of action a great variety of agents come in and displace the first goals so it is a like i said a uh, give and take and a, a completely flexible liminal space nature of objects the nature of actors and of course the type of study which is done and this is why i keep saying that no longer is this facade of objectivity acceptable in academic research so ant claims to be able to find order much better after having let the actors deploy the full range of controversies so it is like you are telling this particular idea we are not trying to create categories we are only trying to allow you to explore your worlds and we are looking at it from not a distance but within it our perspective is also placed within this discourse so the task of defining and ordering should be left to the assemblage itself and not taken up by the analyst so the idea of research also is undergoing a slight change a paradigm shift here because you know i think it began again begins with foucault because foucault very clearly speaks about the idea of categorization mocks the idea of categorization when it creates knowledge the type of animals and birds and all that and how you categorize it and then try to develop meaning out of it so with ant the idea of categorization is let go because categories constantly restructure themselves this is the notion that is put forward all right yeah so every discipline is a slow training and devising the right sort of relativism and um, sociology or literature all these disciplines also are trying to invent their own path so ant claims that we will have a very very rational logical way of building the social world if we abstain from interrupting these contradictions these controversies and trying to create order out of it so if you can relate it to chaos theory again the idea will become very clear so uh, in the world ant is trying to travel through no displacement seems possible without translations so uh, when you talk about moving one thing out and placing it with another there is a sort of translation that is happening and the word ant you know it's not just a, a short form of actor network theory but the um, it is also a reference to the uh, uh, insect as well because the ant scholar has to move like an ant carrying heavy gear in order to find the thinnest connection so it's not going to be an easy task but the idea is that you place yourself within this assemblage and try to look at the idea that is generated and for this reason if i may say so um i don't think you know when you are sitting in india and you are looking at a novel written by uh, a european or uh, an american Uh, unless and until you find the cultural context the technological context the actor network theory will not make sense to you so a simple analysis is not what the ant scholar is doing the ant scholar is looking at a particular assemblage at a particular time and how that is reflected within literature another area where ant has done huge work is the area of translation so translation now and i don't know how many of you are interested in translation but if you look at the entire idea of translation you have multiple actors and multiple actors and the binary is very very fragile you have a text right and then you have a translated text so you have two texts which are coexisting at the same time mutually dependent on each other and you have the writer as well as a translator who are again in a very difficult relationship it can be one of trust it can be one of distrust 
it can be where you are completely breaking away from the or, uh, the so, so called original text so if you look at it from a nectar network point of view or a nomadic point of view you understand that you can call it text a, x and text y so text x is an assemblage text y is also an assemblage because there are a lot of factors here one you have the writer you have the text you have the editor you have the publisher you have the award network you have the canonizing you know whether it is included in the canon whether it has been banned so these socio political features also become a huge problem there at the same point of time you have the translation as well and within the translation is also another assemblage so when you're looking at a trans this is very um, you know useful when you study translations because translations cannot be studied unless you are bilingual uh, how will you understand whether what is lost or what is gained in translation for example if you don't know turkish how can you do a translation study on pama pamuk not possible it can only be done when you are familiar with the language of the first text and the translated text and then and, and when we apply this notion of actor network theory our ideas of translation will become brighter will gain a whole lot of meaning and it will cease to exist as two distant texts the uh, distance by language rather these two texts will be assemblages which come into contact and constantly reinforce each other or question each other display threaten to displace each other but then sort of existing in a sort of contradictory ambivalence i do not know whether i have made any sense to you but if you were to look deeper into the idea of translation you will understand what i'm trying to tell you because the uh, very simple the uh, idea that words can change meanings you know and um, lot depends upon the translator because the translator can uh, sort of refuse to acknowledge a particular meaning if it is not within his political dimension or his gender dimension he or she can choose to ignore it and you have certain translators who uh, make it a point to push their political agenda into a text that they are translating i hope you understand that so this becomes a fertile area of research when you bring in the idea of actor network theory into the concept of translation and the politics of translation as well because um, you know why does a book get translated what is the reason uh, sometimes um, a book is very rooted in its ethnicity the di a dialect is used and the dialects are increasingly i mean exceedingly difficult to translate there is you cannot find an equivalent because uh, when you look at supposing you are uh, reading in hindi and they have used a particular variant of hindi when you translate it into english most often what you do is you use a standardized model of english so your choice that's a translator's choice and in order to understand the translator's choice you have to look at a whole lot of other questions as well and this is why i said that text x as well as text y are assemblages and they are mutually reinforcing each other so i'll just give you one example to so a very simple example uh, in malayalam uh, when you write in malayalam mm, uh, the relationships you know uh, you have n number of words to refer to aunts and uncles uh, your mother sister is a, is a particular name lm uh, father sister has another name your mother's brother's wife has a different name and i think this this is there in hindi as well and uh, um, all these different relationships are shown very uh, very very clearly with different terms but if you were to translate that into english you have just one word aunt or one word uncle and then you have to add these affixes of paternal uncle maternal uncle and uh, this is very indian sounding because in those uh, when you write uh, for an english audience you do not find these affixes and grandmother and grandfather it's not dada dadi or nana nani where you immediately understand whether it's a maternal or paternal so these are choices that a translator makes whether to put in the adjective or whether to let it be so again these are choices and this choice comes out of a particular assemblage in which the translator is definitely placed so just like no research can be completely objective in nature translation cannot also be objective there is an actor and the text is an actant we have to say that the text also acts upon the translator 
sort of defining the choices the translator makes and the translator can redefine the text also so this exists in a sort of uh, uh, what do i say a moving state a come evolving state where the evolution is never complete and that is when an actor network idea becomes very fruitful in looking at it and the non human actors as well supposing the translation you are doing um, you, uh, there is a text which um, you take ts eliot's text for example that exists in print supposing you are creating another media for it a adaptation they would call it translation as well as adaptation and you are putting it as a hypertext with uh, uh, readings and all that what would you do you are you making a choice here right the modality is different the media is different and definitely your presence as a producer and as a consumer comes into play here so uh, the idea that a text acts upon the uh, creator and the creator also acts upon the text so i'll just give you one more example this might make it clear one second the non human actor so the non human um, can have a brain. like we said we initially we thought of actors as people with agency and actors were mostly human so non human can have a very broad meaning and this may cause confusion in understanding the concept so what constitutes a non human in category of non human you can have machines animals texts money architecture things objects bees microbes scallops rocks and ships even ants monkeys and apes all these things are there so anything that modifies the state of affairs by making a difference is an actor or if it has no configuration yet it is an actant but the idea is that sometimes the non human can become the actor as well and they become catalyst for change i'll just give you this uh, example uh, now this is a book called the mushroom at the end of the world the mushroom at the end of the world and it is written by anna tsing t s i n g all right anna tsing the mushroom at the end of the world so please listen carefully to this because this is a text which will make it very clear to you as to what actor network theory is trying to do now it is a multi species ethnography the mushroom at the end of the world is a multi species ethnography and it displaces the human centric perspective that guides social science scholarship and downplays this uh, significance of non human contributions so anna anna ting tsing focuses on the globalized trade of matus uh, stacky mushrooms so this mushroom matus stacky mushrooms um are in huge demand in japan and it is a, an important cultural product also but for some reason this doesn't grow too much in japan and she connects the economic activity to the cultural dimensions of exporting and consumption of the mushroom so um yeah one second at the center of our account is the matsutake it's a mushroom that is a popular gift in japan and is symbolic of japanese identity so the story is that you know after the huge nuclear disaster the first thing to grow in japan were the matsutake mushroom but because of uh, encroachments and development and all that uh, the mushroom doesn't grow that much in japan Uh, what happened was that the pine, there was a specific kind of pine tree and the matsutake mushroom that lived in partnership, and this allowed them to thrive in disturbed, human disturbed areas, open areas, conditions that are available in various parts of the world and created by human-induced degradation. So please understand this. Only if the, if the land is very pure and unpolluted, this doesn't grow. it only grows in a world a space where there is human induced degradation and um, it doesn't grow there so what is uh, what happens now so sing actually visits 
different countries where these mushroom production is happening and she calls it patches of land so it takes her to the pine forests of finland the china's yunnan province and it also takes her into the gift culture of japan and to the pine forest reforestation attempts there so one interesting thing that she does is she takes the reader to forests in america and the foragers who live there the people who actually go to the woods and try to get these mushrooms now these people some of them most of them are illegal immigrants and uh, they do not have a welfare card or anything or any identity markers but they are involved in this global network of consumption and distribution and they make a living out of it so and the traders who buy and sell them so you have a chain here the foraja who's an illegal entity in a particular area the traders who buy and sell them and the japanese consumers who price them as gifts so she highlights the resilience of the mushroom which the humans have found cannot be domesticated it can't be grown like that and the entanglements the codependency of different species or multi species assemblages and this book is a brilliant piece where it turns the commerce and ecology of this very rare mushroom into a modern parable of post industrial survival and environmental renewal so she talks of patterns of unintentional coordination so it's a long chain right and human beings and the mushroom they're all connected within this chain and the patterns are not intentional they have just come into being they are unrelated or unintentional and come together for a particular point of time so these assemblages according to singh are open ended gatherings and they allow us to ask about effects without assuming the effects and this approach which emphasizes co-productive relations among humans and non-humans redirects readers um, in uh, from concepts in which non-humans are subordinated to human ends as shapers of the worlds including human identity and practice matustaki mushrooms pine forests and other non-humans deserve more credits so um if uh, this is a, a non fiction text now if i were to use a fictional narrative i would use amitabh ghosh and the way in which you can look at the ibis trilogy as well as the gun island written by amitabh ghosh using the actor network theory it is a novel you know, we often talked about uh, ibis trilogy you know, the river of uh, smoke and the sea of poppies and all that from a ecological perspective from the colonial perspective from the uh, sort of post colonial narrative as such but rarely have we looked at how a non human actant like the um, opium uh, like nature actually has a huge impact on the structure of the lives that human beings lead and uh, somewhat like deep ecology right somewhat like deep ecology but the limitation of deep ecology is that deep ecology merely focuses on nature it doesn't factor in the idea of technology it doesn't factor in the idea of uh, this globalization or uh, industrialization at all if at all it looks at industrialization globalization from a very negative perspective because deep ecology is all about sustaining nature all right and another problem with deep ecology or eco feminism is that it essentializes women it essentializes nature whereas actor network theory factors in all these things and look uh, the paradox here when technology has been invented by humans to better themselves to make themselves better theories which look at technology actually place human beings at a subservient level where the human beings do not have much agency they are controlled both by nature as well as by technology so these are all mutually interdependent factors and these factors come together for a particular point of time create something move away do something different uh, it's like you know you you, you use yeast, yeast and um, some spices to uh, brew alcohol right it's an assemblage it's an illicit assemblage but these substances by themselves are not illicit so it is irreducible now if i say that no look i'm just um, not brewing alcohol i'm just cooking yeast not true there is an assemblage there that has I, i'm not looking at the different factors of the assemblage i'm looking at the assemblage itself with the firm idea 
that this is going to change. All right, the only firm thing that I can be assured about is that this assemblage is going to restructure itself. I, you can do beautiful and very fruitful readings of Gun Island as well as the Ibis trilogy using the actor, actor network theory because the ship, you have looked at the ship as a heterotropic space. You have looked at the way caste, gender, hierarchy, everything melts down. But many of us have not actually thought about the lack of agency whether it is uh, not talk, just talking about the subalterns not talking about the subalterns alone at all because their lack of agency is very clear we're talking about the lack of agency that the idea of the human has when compared to the non-human so if we had all only thought of the non-human without agency we are now thinking of the human also without agency and they're mutually acting against or with each other, producing a particular assemblage existing at a particular point of time. I think that um, the first uh, example that I gave you of Indian independence and the textile industry was a brilliant piece of research, a PhD, part of a PhD thesis, which was produced. And uh, um, Anna Singh's book, of course, is uh, no, no, uh, non-fiction, which uh, brilliantly uh, sort of uh, conceptualizes the idea of globalization. And when we think of globalization as extraordinarily exploitative, uh, capitalist oriented, we understand that, you know, uh, these uh, illegal immigrants to America actually make a living in this globalized franchise of Masutaki mushrooms by foraging in these human disturbed forests. So the idea of the human disturbed area, which can be seen as very negative from a deep ecological point of view, actually becomes sustaining in the actor network point of view. I hope you have understood these things. It's not very easy to understand. It requires stepping out of your preconceived notions, stepping out of these ideas of, you know, anthropocentric religions and anthropocentric view of humanity and thinking of humans as just one strand where they act definitely, but they are also acted upon. And another factor that has to be, this is very clear uh, in both the, the uh, Indian freedom struggle example, as well as in uh, uh, Tissing's Masutaki Mushroom and in Amitabh Ghosh's uh, hybrid trilogy, that in order to understand globalization, imperialism, commercialism, technology is definitely a factor. Whether it is the old ship in which Vasco da Gama came or the you know, jet setting crowd that is existing now due to globalization. So all these things have to be factored in. And that is the beauty of actor network theory because it talks of these black boxes, you know, borrowing a term from the aircraft, the black boxes in which these fragile assemblages exist at a particular period of time. But it is aporeatic to borrow a deconstructed terminology because it can become a double bind. It can again change and reinvent itself. Uh, you trace the journey in, in uh, Amitabh Ghosh's Ibis trilogy. This can become very, very clear to you uh, when you look at it. So just take a, a little more time to give you some more definitions of the actor network theory and the increasing number of human actors uh, have been identified in uh, ANC, but these human actors can occupy a subservient position to non-human actors. For example, you look at a translation, uh, a particular translation, and you have an editor. So the editor may be dependent on the type of machinery that is going to produce this particular text, the type of uh, print that is going to happen, the type of paper that is going to be present, uh, be used. So these are non-human factors which definitely have a uh, sort of impact on the editor. And if the editor is planning to use this text on a multimedia production, again, the technology that he's going to use is going to have an effect on him or her, as the case may be. So you have uh, fuzzy and incoherent boundaries between human and non-human actors and the entire network as a whole. And the identities are accepted as fixed in their particular context. So that is before and after the context, they have different identities. So when you study identity, the entire concept, discourse of identity, the fragmentary nature of identity, again, the actor network theory can be of use to you. A very simple example, Think of how you project yourself on social media. So whether you are on Facebook or Instagram, your profile is different. The names you assume can be different. Your identity is different. The pictures you post may be different. So what is deciding your identity here? It's not just you. It is the 
social media platform as well and the structure of the social media pla platform that sort of gives rise to a particular form of identity and I, I was speaking about translation and B Guzlin, B U Z E L I N, is one of the first researchers to undertake studies on translation under production within publishing houses. And she uses ethno methodology and field work. And she has used interviews, participant observation, and uh, to sort of check the accuracy of their claims. So uh, the first route was just following the actors. Now the researchers are using archival documents, letters that have been exchanged between translation actors as their source of data. So Ant insists that society and nature cannot be separated. And when applied to translation, this regard data regarding the non-human should the researcher to uh, consider non-humans and their agencies as an indispensable part of any production, all right? So that's about it. Um, I hope I've made this clear. I know it is not a very easy concept, particularly if you have not been exposed to actor network theory before. But yeah, this is what I have to say.